What can be learned in cities across America that continue to struggle with civil unrest and racial inequities? Well, the Ferguson Commission that was created in the wake of Michael Brown Jr.'s killing by police officer Darren Wilson in 2014 was co-chaired by the Reverend Starsky Wilson from St. Louis. He's a Dallas native and he'll be with us on Good God. Stay tuned. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm pleased to welcome to the program today the Reverend Starsky Wilson. Starsky, glad to have you here on Good God. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Rev. Now, Starsky, you are a native of Dallas, yes. and so welcome home. We're glad, glad to have you here, but you've been in St. Louis uh, for a while now and uh, pastor for the last seven years at, at United Church of Christ. Uh, pastor for 10 years. 10 pastor years there, yep. okay, all right. But for the last seven, you've also been the president and CEO of the Deaconess Foundation. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about the Deaconess Foundation. Yeah, so Deaconess is the uh, successor uh, to uh, a 130-year-old mission uh, established by the Evangelical uh, Senate of North America, uh, the Evangelical Deaconess Society. Uh -huh. So uh, it, for the last 20 years, after serving in health ministry, developing into a health system, in 1998 transitioned to a grant-making foundation. Okay. And so our grant-making for the last 20 years has focused on advancing child well-being, mm -hmm. uh, and we do that today through racial equity and public policy work. Uh, supporting sustainable solutions uh, for children and families in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Well, you mentioned children, and I think it's an important thing for us to bring up at this point since uh, it's been 50 years since uh, 1968, mm -hmm. and uh, all of the hope uh, that was building in 1968 that we were entering a new place uh, in this in our society. There, there were breakthroughs, there were hopeful moments, and then um, King's assassination and so many, you know, uh, other things took place at that time. There, there has been a sense of postponement, hasn't there? Yeah. A sense of loss. Uh, how does it feel to you in in doing this work f 50 years later? Yeah, I continue to talk about it as unfinished business. Uh, yeah. So I think about and have framed across um, the span and country uh, King's unfinished sermon. Yes. Um, uh, his ongoing conversation about unfulfilled dreams, uh, his yes. conversation about Schubert's unfinished symphony. Yes. Uh, all of these are things that, and themes that I think we uh, are still yet to lean into. Uh, but most mm -hmm. significantly, uh, because of our work at Deaconess, because it is faith-related work for justice, uh, I tend to pick up the, the, the mantle and be thoughtful about the work that Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund is doing, okay. right? If you think mm -hmm. about King's last campaign mm -hmm. as the Poor People's Campaign, right. um, uh, she tells the story of her little apartment in D.C. being the official offices right. of the Poor People's Campaign because she was the public policy director. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the work and the policy agenda that many people have forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, that policy agenda for economic justice, that policy agenda to reduce poverty uh, that people like uh, Senator Kennedy had uh, taken up yes. and given significant attention to, right. uh, has lived for the last 45 years mm -hmm. uh, in the ongoing work uh, that Marion is doing, that the Children's Defense Fund has been doing uh, to try to shape a future and a community uh, that is fit for our children, that advances uh, their well-being and that prioritizes it uh, among public policy conversations. So I think this is where we find uh, a connection uh, to that 50-year mark today, uh, and even the Renewing Poor People's Campaign that people like um, Dr. Barbara and others uh, are lifting up right. in, uh, in our attention. So you talk about economic justice and the, the, the Poor People's Campaign and, and, and the Deaconess Foundation working on uh, public policy yeah. and, uh, and, and, and asset investments uh, in, in certain areas. For many people, uh, I, I think the language of economic justice sounds like a critique of America's free enterprise system, yeah. uh, a, a feeling that somehow um, it's uh, a, a way of government getting in, out of its lane and into uh, the marketplace where the, uh, the marketplace should handle things on its own and yeah. sort of the invisible hand of the marketplace, all those sorts of things. And yet, uh, we've had about 50 years now of, yeah. of laissez-faire economics, you might say, yeah. laissez -faire, to allow the marketplace to do its work. What we've seen is this incredible uh, growing gap of, of uh, wealth distribution right. uh, uh, between um, uh, white Americans and black Americans, net worth uh, 
tremendously skewed. A hundred thousand dollar gap. Uh, and yeah, a, 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 exactly, a hundred thousand dollar gap, and which which is to say almost zero net worth in the average African American family. So how do you how do you talk to people who are used to thinking about the marketplace as being the savior uh, that you know a rising tide lifts all boats and that sort of thing? How do you talk to them about how uh, there is a role to play yeah. in in targeting investment and in public policy? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that depends on who the person is, right? So, uh, yeah. so these days, uh, I increasingly talk to folks in the St. Louis region uh, about the impact uh, of uh, market leadership. Right. Mm -hmm. So you talk about uh, Leslie Crutchfield has a book on how uh, movements work or how mm -hmm. change happens. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things she talks about uh, is the role of uh, corporations in advancing public policy. Yes. Uh, we've seen very recently, while in our state, uh, we just passed an increase by referendum uh, of the minimum wage over the course of the next uh, three to four years. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted more, but we. We were able to get through uh, with the people an increase uh, uh, that will uh, be phased in through 2023. But at the same time we were doing that, uh, the campaign really wanted $15 in a union. Mm -hmm. And while we were collecting signatures to get that done in our state, uh, Amazon and Walmart moved uh, to make that happen within the context of their so company. So there's, there's leadership from the marketplace. Yeah, there's leadership in the marketplace in recognition uh, that this is indeed because of high employment uh, mm -hmm. across the nation. This right. is indeed in many ways a buyer's market when it comes to right. uh, workers. So if they're going to keep their workers, they have to right. pay a, a valuable wage. Now, this is important as we talk about the previous question uh, about uh, 1968. So sanitation workers in 1968 in Memphis were making just under $2 an hour. Just wow. For inflation, they'd be making nineteen dollars an hour today. Wow. We're fighting over fifteen dollars for yes, now, right? Right. Um, the other thing I say to to uh, elected officials who respond, quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, to market actors primarily to corporations exactly uh, in their work uh, is that they may be missing an opportunity uh, in just tweaking and targeting how they do their work. Mm -hmm. uh, what we found when we went through the process of leading the Ferguson Commission in St. Louis was that St. Louis ranked forty second in economic mobility mm -hmm. in Raj Chetty from Harvard University study uh, of what it takes for a family to make it from one economic rung to the next within a generation. Yes. What we also found was that we actually have enough jobs to put our people fully to work. What we did not have uh, was a connection in transportation oriented development to get the people who need the jobs to the places where the jobs were. Right. Yeah, there you so go. there's some basic infrastructure needs. Um, that Which is a government inform. responsibility. Government responsibility. So exactly. how can we talk to uh, right. government and elected officials about how they respond to market needs, the market needs the workers, mm -hmm. uh, by investing in appropriate infrastructure and doing that with a racial equity lens. What we found was that where black and brown people live are where the people are who need the jobs, right. but where people who are not black and brown folks are is where the jobs actually live. Right. Uh, and so and when we get into talking about extending transportation and development right. uh, out to some of those places, then the NIMBYs show up, right? Not yeah. in my backyard. Not in my backyard. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. so, um, so one of these, uh, so I think there's some targeted ways to talk about tweaking policy okay. that are both asset related and income related. Well, and with the Citizens United decision that happened a few years ago, that's been uh, a boon to some, but uh, bemoaned by others yeah. as, uh, as calling corporations individuals or persons, yeah. uh, you might say, and giving a virtual unlimited ability for corporations to target their political uh, contributions and the like. So uh, in a sense, what you're saying, I think, is uh, if we could turn that to the good yeah. uh, and, and and had moral leadership that was visionary about the whole community yeah. uh, to, to bring greater inclusion and participation, uh, we could use it to our advantage instead of against it. Yeah, I think that's a significant element. I also think this uh, um, robust engagement and investments in uh, de democratic participation are critically required, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I use the example of what we've been what we've been able to do in the state of Missouri by petition initiative over the course of the last few years, uh, including some things that have been pushed back uh, by mm -hmm. a legislative environment that's not been friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we kind of zero in on core values, uh, if mm -hmm. democracy is still a value, right. uh, then we have to be thoughtful about how we get the best will 
will for the most, uh, the will of most of the people uh, yeah. in and through our governmental structures and live those values, uh, articulate them in our uh, public policy articulations and ordinances, statutes and laws, uh, and then begin to live them out. And, and I think that's the challenge. Uh, if, uh, if we're still a, f uh, a group of people who say that one vote and one voice uh, is what defines us, mm -hmm. uh, then we've got to be thoughtful about how that plays out in uh, democratic reform and participation as well. So we, we seem to be in a time, though, where uh, the, the polls are widening uh, the, in terms of differences from one another, the ideologies and, and the like. And, uh, and participation in the common good requires that people know one another and draw closer to one another and begin to, to, to ask, what do we have in common and what do we want to focus on here? Uh, not just where can we privilege one another uh, in, in, at the expense of one another. So uh, what are some of the ways that, that you think you can uh, call people together to increase participation and to help them listen to one another and find the common good? Yeah, I think um, common good requires, and this is connected to some of your work, requires a commons, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I think part of the challenge that we're wrestling with is the loss of place or the end of place, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a container by which we can actually rub into one another, mm -hmm. uh, connect with mm -hmm. one another, mm -hmm. and by knowing one another's humanity, begin to see an interest that is indeed common as well. Right, right. Um, so I say that to say, uh, while I appreciate uh, and have uh, uh, seeing the advancements that come from social media engagement and the like, I also am concerned that people don't have contact with one another yes. anymore. And so where we've seen the most significant transformation uh, is the actual kind of door-to-door -door mm -hmm. meeting people, not just in the context of a political season, but right. uh, deep canvassing, if you want to use the political language, door-to-door uh, -door outreach, if you want to mm -hmm. use church language and evangelism in that context, um, such that we actually have uh, a sense of seeing one another, engaging one another. So. Uh, a lot of the stuff is really basic in, in my uh, point of view um, that we've got to get to blocking and tackling. The other uh, is the creation of space. Uh, a few years ago when we were going through strategic planning with Deaconess Foundation, uh, it was just before uh, we began to react and respond uh, to the Ferguson uprising. Um, and uh, we knew that we wanted a better space for our offices. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. We had been a hospital system. So mm -hmm. for years we had massive space. And mm -hmm. of course, uh, a, a health conversion foundation that's doing grant making regionally doesn't need a lot of space. Right. Um, so for 20 years, we're in a nice office suite uh, in downtown mm -hmm. St. Louis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we decided that we wanted to be connected to people. We wanted to convene our grantees. We wanted to hear from people who are affected by our work. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to actually create a space for that. Now that was affirmed in the context of the, of the uprising when I as a pastor kept being called upon uh, to give space away to activists and organizers, yes. people who needed and wanted to meet. And so what that became for us was an affirmation uh, that community members who want to get together to civically engage actually do not have a sense of commons anymore. Yes. So we developed a space. Um, yes. um, the Deaconess Center for Child Wellbeing is a 22,000 square foot space um, that, yes, it houses our offices, it houses a couple of our partners, but most of it is high level, high quality conferencing space that we give away to people who are doing work nice. aligned with our public policy agenda mm -hmm. uh, and create opportunities for them uh, to rub into one another. Uh, but it also upgrades the conversations, right? right. When we talk about uh, business and corporations, this is my one guiding uh, light uh, to the developers. I said, I want this building to be better than the regional chambers offices. Okay. Yeah. I want the yeah. conference center here right. to be of a higher quality because right. I think our children are more valuable than what gets talked about in those conversations the Eco Devo conversation, the economic development conversation that happened there. Um, so we created a wonderful space, and there people are talking about early childhood education, and there people are building power to close a medium security jail, and there nice. just across the street uh, from the juvenile detention center and the family courts, right? A, right. a, a, a physical critique. Uh, folks are building power to advance racial justice nice. for our children. And I think that's part of what's necessary. Is we've got to create the space for people. Well, you know, it sounds like uh, the, the church has contributed to the imagination of what space means. As in almost all of our church traditions, there is a fellowship hall or yes. a community hall, uh -huh. right, where we gather to do this sort of work together. Yes. And, and we also know that you can't have a real church just by watching the live stream. You gotta oh rub God. up against somebody in the pew who's at your elbow, who's 
pouring your cup of coffee, who's sharing their take on scripture, yeah. who's singing the other part in the harmony, right? Yeah. So, so my, um, so I'm just um, just completing this ten year pastorate at St. John's Church, the beloved community, uh, and about a year ago, uh, mm-hmm. after you know following the uprising. Uh, young people wanted to be engaged with our church all over. Right. They said, you know, Pastor, you got a live stream. You gotta. Yeah. We started live streaming, and uh, and I would get these reports on the live stream every day. I could see uh, where people were connecting. And it was great because we had members who had gone over to Indianapolis and right, to Dallas right. and to D.C. And to, but I would see all of these addresses in St. Louis, uh-huh, people uh-huh. sitting at home. I thought, no, It's I the shadow side. So. I yeah, know. Yeah. So, uh, so we pulled down the live stream. You did. Uh, we, okay. And we offer it to connect to people who are out of space with us, right? Okay. So we do have folks who watch every week from Dallas and from St. Louis and from D.C. and from Atlanta. And those who are traveling of the church can okay. get the link. Uh, right. But we don't just send it out uh, because we actually do want people to come and, right. and rub up against one another. Uh, well, let's pick up some more of this after the break. I want to promote the Deaconess Foundation for you uh, during uh, this commercial break, but uh, PSA. Uh, right. But thanks for being with us, and we'll come right back. Glad to be The Deaconess Foundation is called to protect and advocate for the most vulnerable population among us, our children. Improving their well-being benefits us all. Help improve the health of our community. Visit Deaconess.org for more information. We're back with the Reverend Starsky Wilson, and he is uh, from St. Louis, and yet really from Dallas. So (laughs) he's back in Dallas. And... Uh, but Starsky, we, we've had uh, we've had here in Dallas several um, significant, uh, difficult uh, circumstances uh, where there have been uh, police shootings. Uh, obviously, in in one case, it was uh, an African American former um, uh, Army uh, person who shot uh, Dallas police officers, and then we. Uh, of course, that march that night was inspired by the fact that we had had so many examples of police brutality uh, throughout the country prior to that, that it was uh, a, a kind of march to, uh, to defend uh, the um, integrity of the black community over against uh, mistreatment. Uh, but now we've had recently a police officer that's been convicted of murder, Roy Oliver, uh, Jordan Edwards, and we've had an indictment uh, against Amber Geiger, the police officer, uh, for the killing of Botham Jean. Uh, you have been very much involved in St. Louis, especially because of the Ferguson uprising that happened as a result of Michael Brown Jr.'s uh, uh, killing by um, Darren Wilson, the uh, police officer there in Ferguson. Uh, that was back in August of 2014. Mm-hmm. And then in that case, uh, Officer Wilson was not charged. Yeah. Uh, so how did you get involved in this? And what is your takeaway from your experience in all of that that you can help lend to us here in Dallas and in other places? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. I think first and foremost, uh, this unfortunate circumstance speaks to all of our humanity. And so I tell people often, uh, for me, uh, I could not not engage. Yes. Uh, when I saw the images of Michael Brown lying in the pool of his own blood, um, mm-hmm. it was not the first time I had seen that. The first time I saw that, it was my brother. Uh, my mm-hmm. brother who died in community violence, uh, who was mm-hmm. murdered along with three other people in a household in Oak Cliff. Oh, my. Uh, and so the image, the visceral image connected to me uh, and drew me out to be thoughtful about ways that I could be um, mm-hmm. present. Um, and, uh, and much of that um, kind of encompassed all that I had, right? At the time I was pastoring a church, right. this happened on a Saturday. Um, I immediately began to think about what that meant for a message the next day. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had young people who were members of the church who were quite active and already uh, at the site of Michael Brown's killing by the time I found out uh, on uh, on that Saturday. Um, uh, I was um, compelled to be thoughtful about how the foundation could engage. Uh, And and over time, what we recognized uh, was that um, the church as a body desired to be in the streets, and so mm-hmm. we put our bodies in the streets together. Mm-hmm. Um, that the church as a space um, was required for the movement, and so we opened the doors to host mm-hmm. um, the Ferguson Freedom Ride, the Black Lives Matter um, Freedom Ride to Ferguson there by the end of 
August, we were the Welcome Center for Ferguson October. In October of that year, when 10,000 people from across the country came in uh, to St. Louis to show solidarity. Uh, and then through the foundation, I asked for space uh, for us to invest uh, up uh, to invest a pool of resources into uh, mobilization education for young people around youth organizing uh, to shift activists into organizers to put people into public policy positions to build power to transform the situations that they were um, suggesting were uh, concerning them uh, and ultimately the governor asked me to uh, to co-chair the Ferguson Commission okay. uh, to develop a set of uh, public policy recommendations to advance the community forward. Um, so uh, all of these kind of hats, the philanthropic hat, the faith hat, and the public policy hat came um, as a result uh, of uh, responding to my own pain, quite frankly, that connected mm -hmm. with the pain of the moment. So I think people in the white community generally do not understand what role going to the streets plays in uh, beginning a process that uh, that leads to a Ferguson Commission uh, to other things. I think uh, what I hear often is, you know, what good do they think they're doing out in the streets protesting? Uh, but on the other hand, it, it, this is a long history of, uh, of, of people gathering for uh, civil protests uh, of not just black Americans, but yeah. everyone has used uh, the, you know, civil disobedience and protests in the street for larger purposes than simply letting off steam, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it becomes something more, but without which uh, there's not a galvanizing presence that leads to change, right? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things that are misunderstood. First and foremost, the people who gather around Michael Brown's body, those in our community, let's be clear, uh, we went through in the course of the uprising several police-involved shootings. So, yes. so, so yes, Michael Brown and Antonio Martin right. uh, and others. And so uh, it's helpful for us to recognize that people first go to the streets mourning. Yes. Right. Uh, let us be thoughtful about the fact that people are grieving. Good. Uh, and the scenes take on you know, the images and the pictures become something else to us uh, when uh, you add other elements to it. Right? right. When you add police in tanks and yes. uh, when you add tear gas and when you add uh, 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 weaponized vehicles like that doesn't look like mourning to you anymore. No, right, uh, right. But immediately people are gathering to mourn. They're gathering right. to demonstrate support and solidarity for one another. And the extended gathering becomes uh, a witness of resistance, right? That yes. this is a, indeed uh, an evil or an injustice that we do not believe should stand. And so yes. uh, as we speak uh, in the faith language of bearing witness, right? right, right. Uh, it is indeed uh, doing that. Uh, it, is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is giving. Uh, 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 giving proximity in order to be able to articulate a testimony, uh, but it also giving the ministry of presence and bearing witness that this is an, an injustice that will not uh, stand. Um, we should also be thoughtful about ways in which protest shows up, right? So uh, some folks show up to redeem space. Uh, so mm -hmm. the thoughtfulness about the concept of redemption, yes. uh, we engaged on the anniversary of Michael Brown's death at the U.S. courthouse uh, mm -hmm. with faith leaders gathered to deliver to the U.S. attorney uh, the will of the faith community yes. and there anointed the courthouse, which is a space and place of the people, such that it built with the people's money and resources and taxes to do the people's justice and suggesting that it wasn't and engage in liturgical acts in order to Good. reclaim and redeem the space. So Good. all of these are part of what goes into the process of public protest as well. Excellent. So when you when you look at the outcome of the Ferguson Commission that that you co-chaired, what are some of the things that you were able to accomplish in, in making systemic changes? Yeah. Because in every community, the, the, there's always the, the feeling that, okay, this has happened, we're gonna let the legal system take care of it, yeah. and then we're gonna move on, because if we just have good people in place, the, the things will change. But, but sometimes there's deep systemic things going on that, that have to be addressed. Yeah, I think this connects with your previous question about uh, people um, uh, being proximate. Um, yes. Uh, 
uh, I think uh, part of what we've been able to do um, and, and, and what does it mean for people to protest? Uh, I think first and foremost, we should understand that all systems operate within the context of cultures and narratives. Right. Uh, so part of what we were able to do with the commission process, first and foremost, uh, in tandem with the leadership that was being provided in the streets through the uprising was to sustain a narrative uh, mm -hmm. that we had to do something different. Yes. Uh, so there were already, you know, within hours, within a week of the uprising, there were already uh, groups from the chain and from um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau who were worried about the economic impact. Who already, <laughs> you, you know, had PR groups together who right. were already spinning, that we're moving forward together and all this kind of stuff before anything had been done, to be clear. There wasn't a commission until three months into the uprising. Um, but part of what we had to do was to shift and sustain the narrative mm -hmm. uh, to hold people um, in the disequilibrium long enough okay. such that behaviors began to change and that people could do the learning required in order um, to allow that behavior to happen. And I think ultimately, oh, yeah. um, the Forward Through Ferguson report, uh, A Path Toward Racial Equity, helped to frame where we needed to go, the eschatological hope of the community, right? Yes. Where we want to go is to a place where people's life expectancy is not determinable or or predictable by race or by mm -hmm. zip code. Mm -hmm. uh, we laid out a path to do that. And that, first and foremost, became the guiding narrative for the community, its political environment, uh, and the cultural context and the social spaces ever since then. Right. Uh, so that has been the agenda that has informed a mayoral election, a county executive's election, the election of the first black uh, prosecutor, the first black sheriff, uh, the first black prosecutor in the city and in the county. So it became the right. agenda that the people asked about because they were the ones who created it. 3,000 citizens engaged in the process, mobilized more than 30,000 wow. volunteer hours uh, to say to elected officials, to corporate officials, to civic leaders, this is what we want, and then began to mobilize by the thousands mm -hmm. uh, convenings for these elections to say, mm -hmm. I I'm glad to hear what you got to say, but this is our agenda. What right. are you going to get done on it? Nice. Uh, so yes, we passed some laws. We were able to uh, pass Senate Bill 5, which decreased the amount uh, of, uh, of revenue that cities, municipalities can take from small dollar tickets because we found mm -hmm. that this was dehumanizing police and turning them into armed collection agents yes. where they were targeting um, black and brown and young people uh, mm -hmm. and using those young people, right? Creating injustices for them. Um, so, but that was a systemic mm -hmm. um, motivation to make the budget. Right, right. So right. we had to reduce that amount. Uh, we we're also able to do things like uh, examine the school to prison pipeline and see oh. that out of school suspensions were number one in St. Louis among the state of Missouri, which leads the nation in the disparity uh, between out of school suspensions for black boys uh, and white boys, black girls and white girls. Mm -hmm. And so the St. Louis public schools actually banned out of school suspensions for kindergarten, first and second grade. A lot of people are shocked that they were banned. They were well, actually ever there to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Exactly, right? yeah. But it reduced out of school suspensions from 13,000 to 2,000 in two years. Wow. Right? Wow. Um, and so those are the kinds of things we're able to get done. But more than anything else, I think we changed the context and the conversation mm -hmm. of accountability such that people feel that they have to, leaders do, institutions do, feel that they have to articulate, they have to stand and deliver yes. uh, on how they're advancing racial equity in light of that Ferguson Commission report. And I think that's a powerful reality. So there's a there's a tremendous and an important aspect of what you said that had to do with uh, the, the fact that the agenda itself was determined by the people and that, that it was for the first time inclusive of people of color who were ha able to determine what they really want to see happen and create that agenda. But let me ask you, in, in, in all of these movements, the, the question of, of What's the right and proper role of allies in the white community yeah. uh, in, in these circumstances? Because we, we have so much of a historical tendency to want to come in and commandeer and uh, colonize uh, every movement to, to our, our own way of understanding of how things work. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, we also probably don't need to just be on the sidelines. We have to figure out what's the, what's the right uh, calibration of our in engagement and involvement. What what advice or counsel would you give? Yeah, I used to say a lot. I say it less so now, but what I'll say this about the movement for Black Lives specifically. Right? Yes. Uh, I said, you know, what what began or what what was catalyzed uh, in the Ferguson uprising uh, was a multiracial, multicultural, uh, multi ethnic 
um, mobilization of people for black lives, right? Mm -hmm. That was black-led, youth-led, uh, and in many cases, queer-led, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, but it was never all black. right? Uh, so the clarity here is that the movement itself uh, has space for everybody mm -hmm. if one is willing to follow young, black, openly queer or LGBTQ right. leadership, right? right, right. Um, so I say that to say, in that context, allyship is not actually required because you can be in, you don't have to be aside. Okay, right? good, good. Um, you can be in if one is willing, and I think this gets to the advice, to follow young black leadership. Good, good. Uh, and I think we have remarkable examples of the power of that, Great. Uh, of the uh, power of that for all of us mm -hmm. uh, in these respective narratives. And so I think um, that's really the key piece is how can we orient ourselves uh, to follow young, black, brown, queer leadership? If we're willing to do that, uh, then I think we can transform this country into that which we articulated we desire it to be. Well, as, as people of faith, as Christians in particular, we know something about the call to humility. Yes. And of... Of, of looking out for the interests of others before yourself. And so if we just dig into our own tradition and move past our, uh, our color or uh, our social location and, and, and let people lead who are most deeply affected uh, by it, then, then I, I think the sense of collegiality and, and, and being part of something transformational will change us as well, and that's yeah. a beautiful thing. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I think that's the story of the church, right? It really is. Uh, it is uh, folks who uh, renounce privilege in the context of empire uh, to take up community together, uh, and they're following, uh, by and large, uh, young marginalized folks. Uh, in these folks who are uh, right. call themselves disciples and apostles and clearly uh, in the person of Jesus. Well, Starsky, it's a pleasure to meet you and to hear your story and, and what you're involved in. Uh, thank you for coming back to Dallas to help us. And I know we have a lot more to learn from you, but uh, we're glad to have you on Good God and to share in this good work together. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay. Good. The Deaconess Foundation is called to protect and advocate for the most vulnerable population among us, our children. Improving their well-being benefits us all. Help improve the health of our community. Visit Deaconess.org for more information.